Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is uh, something that I always enjoy talking about, especially to this group, because I hope that by the end of it, you'll see that this is something that you can really use in your classrooms. Perhaps not in exactly the way that we do it, but in a way that's really pretty close, uh, and that you let your students engage in experimental evolution in a way that would have been really hard and basically impossible for you to do before with them. Uh, and that's uh, what I'm going to introduce in, uh, uh, a little bit along the way. Um, uh, the program is Amita Ed, which is an education version of what uh, was mentioned as the research platform that we use. It's a system where you can have evolution happening in your computer, uh, and it's an educational version puts a user interface on it that's uh, friendly and aimed at undergraduates, uh, and really can be used at the uh, high school level as well. Uh, and I think by the end of this, you'll get a little sense about why this might be interesting for you to, to possibly use uh, for your class as well. So just to, to say a little bit about the context of this, um, for several years, um, professional societies were involved in a conversation nationally about how we might best reform undergraduate life science curriculum uh, to reflect what we've been learning about um, pedagogy and, and uh, inquiry-based education that really gets uh, hands-on uh, uh, rather than, uh, uh, than, than hands-away. Uh, and, and the document that came out of that uh, it's called Vision and Change, uh, a couple of years ago now. Uh, but what it did was really reflect uh, a consensus, consensus that's emerging, I think, or has emerged uh, within the biological education community about how to do this. And for you, this is, this is probably very familiar. Um, this is aimed at the undergraduate level, of course, but it's now had effects uh, further down. And this is another document that you would have seen, probably here, very familiar to you. Um, which very much reflects the same um, uh, attitude, the same findings of vision and change. Uh, and just to look at a little bit of the details to see how it is that evolution now figures explicitly uh, in a very central way uh, in the recommended curriculum. Here's just an example of, of some of the aspects of that. Uh, uh, enduring understanding, these are, these are basic concepts. Um, focusing, as you can see, I'm going to read them for you, but. Uh, uh, on evolution in a variety of, of its core elements. Um, going on to talk about what the specific content would be, for example, in one of these things. Um, the first one, change in genetic makeup of the population over time is what evolution is. Here are some elements of that that you need to get across in an AP curriculum. Natural selection being a major mechanism. Not the only one, but a major one. Uh, how it acts uh, on uh, you know, to the variations uh, in the population. Uh, also driven by random processes. So it's actually important to know sort of the relationship between the random and the non-random elements uh, to show how evolution works. Uh, and then the general evidence that supports this, uh, including aspects from mathematical uh, knowledge. Now, a nice way, of course, that people are introduced to things is, is by the wonderful adaptations that one sees in the world, the charismatic megafauna or the, or the, or the good ones, of course. But it's important to, to get people to see that evolution happens at all levels, right? It's not just the, the barnacles, not just the whales, but the barnacles that are on the whales uh, that are also evolving. And of course, they don't just stick to whales. <laughs> they might be adapted to other whale-like looking things, in this case, a big boat, uh, but the point is that it all works the same way. Whether it's talking about whales or barnacles, they are adapting to environments uh, in, in whatever way they can. Uh, this is actually one of the things that Darwin uh, said. Before he did the Origin of Species, he spent quite a number of years becoming the world expert on barnacles. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you Google the barnacle image page, you'll find Darwin sitting right in the middle of it, with Darwin doll. Uh, and then just tons and tons of different varieties of, of barnacles and so on. Uh, by the end of the study, Darwin hated barnacles, <laughs> but he had learned a lot about them, and really he learned uh, much about uh, the great variation, uh, even in so simple an animal. So this is the, some of the color pages from the book that he published on this, uh, which just goes into incredible detail about not just the stamp forms globally, but also fossil forms. 
Uh, so he looked into this, uh, and part of what he did was simply show the basic elements that he was going to make use of in the book that followed, uh, here focusing really on the vast number of, of variations of, of all sorts and in all aspects of, of this creature. Um, that's one element, of course, of the, of the mechanism, that you have variation. Um, the other element, of course, is that you have to have that variation uh, inherited, that's what replication does. Uh, and then you have natural selection coming in to operate upon those variations, uh, repeat, um, and you get the second modification. Which was Darwin's term, uh, evolution wasn't the term that he used, it involved only at the uh, very end. The second modification is the key um, result of that process. And the adaptations that you see are those um, results that we, that we see. And again, the point is, this happens at all, at all levels. Uh, and Beacon, the thing that we focus on is looking at it as you can see it happen at all levels. And so you see that part of what we're doing is, is hyenas, but also part of what we're doing is, is E. coli. Okay? And in the next talk, you're going to hear specifically about Schlensky's long term evolutionary experiment, which lets one see that replication over now 60,000 generations and how natural selection uh, operates on that. The interesting thing that I want to try to get across to you is the aspect in which, at Beacon, we look at these processes in those living systems, but also in digital systems that let one express the very same causal processes. And this is one conceptual element that links those two processes. Uh, on the left, you have the genome of, uh, of E. coli. Uh, and everyone, of course, is familiar with talking about the genetic code. And, the program that's uh, uh, expressed uh, as the code uh, turns into a little creature. Okay. Um, those elements of code and program are really the things that are the basis for what makes the process work. Right? You have to have something coded, which can then vary. Right? The program is the actualization of that. And, and that's something that happens or can happen uh, in a computer system as well. On the right, what we have is the genome of a digital organism, in this case, the genome of an avidian, which is the fond way we speak of our little creatures in, in Amida. Uh, and I'm going to show you in a minute how that works. But the point here is the process that's happening, the causal process of variation, replication, uh, and natural selection, is going to happen exactly the same way in this code as it does in the other code, at, those, at that level of operation. Here we're not modeling the specifics of DNA. Uh, we're not modeling anything biochemical. We're modeling the thing that Darwin discovered, which is just those causal elements at a level of abstraction that can work at all these levels. Okay? And that's the general point that uh, is of interest to us. Replication is one, right? That's a second. And when you uh, show this in your class, you might make use of some microorganism. And you're going to look at how you start from one, and then you produce a whole population of these things. Uh, you'll talk about how variation arises in that, and then you'll talk about how natural selection uh, works upon it. Well, we can watch replication happening uh, in the digital system as well. So this is from the Vita Ed, and what we're doing is watching now as that genome is replicating itself. Uh, it's essentially copying the elements of its code and dividing. So essentially you're seeing cell division in this case. Uh, it's not a cell, it's just, it's just computer instructions. But the instructions here have to work in sequence, not uh, something where we program the copy again. The copy is part of the instructions that are, that are there. And in that process, you can have random mutations that happen in the code. So if you take a look at the one on the right, there are a few cases that have little green circles around the outside. And if you compare right to left, you'll see that those are the points at which there's a difference. Okay? Those represent mutations that have happened where one instruction has randomly changed to another instruction. Right? And that just happens at whatever frequency the, the environment happens to have at that point. Uh, that produces variation. So what you've seen already, just in a very quick slide, is replication and the introduction of variation. Right? So that process is going to be happening in a computer environment. Right? Uh, 
Now, the next thing you're going to be able to see is, is natural selection uh, as well. Here's now that genome in a population. So on the right now, you're seeing each square representing one organism. So we talked about this in the Vita Ed as a virtual petri dish. Uh, you start out with one little organism, and it's going to replicate in really the same kind of way that you saw it in that uh, material case. Um, uh, but here, as they replicate, they move into a neighboring square, the uh, offspring place into a neighboring square. You'll see as the population then um, uh, expands. You can watch that as well here. Here is a population that's already started to go. This is kind of stop motion one, so you can see. Uh, it goes along. Here the colors are representing thickness, and you can sort of see a bloom of a light colored subpopulation that is thinner than others and then expands and takes over um, uh, the others in the population. So that now is happening because those happen to be able to reproduce faster in the population. Right? So they're going to be naturally selected over others, but they reproduce uh, more quickly. Uh, and you can watch that process at a population level uh, happening in the virtual petri dish. So very quickly then, you've seen all the elements happening, uh, variation, inheritance, uh, and natural selection. And all of those things are going to be visible to a student uh, in that population. And then you can do experiments. So here's an example where you've had the evolution of a one organism in one environment that has a high mutation rate and another one that has uh, it's been involved in, in an environment with a low mutation rate. And now what I'm going to do is run an experiment where I take each and put it into the other's environment. Okay, so uh, blue was one uh, that evolved in the one environment. And I'm going to take its, and set its ascendant out and put it in with the descendants of that original yellow one, and then vice versa. And we're going to watch to see how they, how they do relative to each other. And this is the sort of thing that's going to let your students really see a notion of how fitness works. Uh, that it's not an absolute thing, it's relative to who you're competing against and which population you're in. Um, blue doesn't do as well in the population that yellow involved in. Yellow is adapted to that environment, and boy does it do well. Blue evolved in a high mutation rate environment, and it managed to evolve code that was robust to a higher rate of mutations. Yellow doesn't do as well in that. And you can see here, even though you started with now the same organisms in both of these two uh, virtual dishes, one clearly is fitter in one environment, one is clearly fitter in the other. And you can watch really the results of the evolution that happens. So these are the sorts of things that you're going to be able to do with your students. They can set up an experiment, they can run them, they can watch the results. <coughs> so um, this is now something that we do very broadly for investigating uh, a wide range of, of, uh, of hypotheses. But it can be used in all sorts of other ways as well. This is a, a 3D uh, world. It's not a beacon related one, but it shows very nicely how it works. A little stick figure that's in a, in a virtual world. And, and we're trying to evolve, in this case, the, the researchers here, uh, motion controllers that can get it to, to walk. Uh, and in this case, it's rewarded if it goes a little bit further than the other. Uh, and after a number of generations, it starts to get a little bit better. It's a little drunk, actually, at this point. <laughs> but eventually, the controller evolves so that it has um, uh, the ability now to control the motion and keep it from falling over and stride along in a, in a very effective uh, manner. So that was evolution that essentially produced that program, right? The code was evolving. Um, and it wasn't the programmer who did that. The programmer just set up the environment to allow evolution to do that. So this is a little more visually interesting, but the same process can be used in lots of different, different ways. So here's one on, uh, with one of my graduate students. Uh, uh, again, with a 3D virtual world, um, this is not an animation. Right? So this is a, a, a physics-based world where they have to actually um, move around in, an environment that has a virtual physics to it. So if they bump into something, they actually have a uh, physics-based bump and so on. I've simulated as such. So in this uh, video here, you've got a little four-legged table-like figure uh, which uh, moves along. And the thing we were investigating was um, 
uh, one of the things we're looking at here was uh, gate, the evolution of gate. Uh, and it turns out actually that the, the quadruped gate is, is pretty hard to, to do. And uh, this was a hand-coded uh, creature uh, done by the person who actually did this program. This was not us, so this was, this was their table. And it's actually hard to write a program to make a four-legged creature move along. And that's something that he was able to do. And our question was, could evolution do that? Could evolution produce a controller that could make a quadruped move along anywhere comparable to what this program had done? Okay, so here's what evolution produced uh, in our system. So the table looks a little bit different, but it's essentially the same sort of thing. Uh, and in this case, what we did was start out essentially with a table uh, with possible uh, movements of joints in the same way that that little stick figure was moving. Now it's going to be a little table. And the thing that is randomly varying is a controller that could lift, move, change the angles, and so on. So now we're going to watch what evolution did after generations of um, evolving a, a possible controller for this. So it looks along pretty effectively. <laughs> uh, and depending upon your aesthetics about this, I think many people think that this is actually a little more realistic, uh, a little more organic looking than the rather robotic movements of the hand-coded one. Uh, so evolution can produce a controller, and as I said, the controller is hard to do for a, for a quadruped. And not only can they do it, they can do it in a way that's at least as good as what the programmer can do. Uh, this is something that's actually now been used in real cases. Um, if you ever remember the, the Sony robots, the new robot dog, um, the programmers had gotten it to sit on the bag and walk and so on, but they couldn't get it to run. It was really hard to program that. And it turned out to be someone who was using this technique of evolutionary computation that put evolution on the task. And if you watch the Sony robot run, that was an evolutionary program that succeeded in doing that. So again, this is the sort of thing where we're now able to move from this virtual world into the real world. And this is another case uh, from uh, our work at Beacon, looking at trying to see how evolution might produce a controller now for something similar to the way uh, that these little guys do. And, and uh, the idea is you've got a little flagellum that you can move around, uh, and you don't have much control over it. If you move in one direction, you move straight. If you move in the other direction, you move off at random. So how can you move anywhere intentionally with just that? Well, it turns out that they're able to do it pretty well. Could evolution do it? That's what we want to find out. So we have a virtual world with a, a gradient here. And the question was, could they evolve a controller that could use just those two motions and find a way up the gradient to the peak of the resource? And the other thing that they have is a sensor, and they have to evolve the ability to sense and see, am I doing better than I was before, so that I can tell that I'm making progress. And in fact, what these creatures evolved was a process that allowed them to do pretty much what the real organisms do, namely, move along, test to see whether you're getting better than you were before with regard to the intensity of whatever that gradient is. If you are, keep going in the same way, but if you're not, then go off at random, right? Test again, right? If you're still going off in the wrong way, go off at random again, right? If now you're going a way that makes it better, then keep going. So you have to combine those things in relationship to the sensor. And that's essentially what we did in this case. The bottom uh, diagram represents sort of averages of the types of movements over the generations. It's a little hard to see here. If you have more time, I can show you exactly what was happening. But by the end of it, you can sort of see the little peak there. That's an indication that what they've done is evolve the ability to move to the peak of the resource. And what we did then was take that evolved program and put it into a little robot, which is what you see on the upper right. It's essentially a little Roomba. You see those little vacuum robots. But this one, we added a, a light sensor on it. Uh, and the light sensor now checks the intensity of the light. The program is the same the one that was involved in that virtual world, but now is controlling the wheels of the Roomba and sensing it in relation to the light. And in fact, here's what we get in the end. So we call the bacteria bot from the driving suit of my Laura, Laura Grabowski. Uh, and here's what the little guy does. He's now moving uh, off of one direction, away from where the light is, and is saying, boy, I'm not getting any better. Let me just go off at random. It 
turns a little bit. It's still not going toward many lights, so it goes off at random again. And now it says, wait a second, it's getting brighter, moving toward light. Let me keep going, let me keep going. Okay, so it continues on in that direction. It's going, in this case, towards light, towards light. And it's only when it gets sort of past that and the intensity starts to go down that it will then turn and uh, try to do better again. And again, this was a controller that was evolved in the virtual world and then just translated down to a real robot. And you see that behavior in action. So again, this is not just uh, something that happens in a computer. You can take what's happening there and put it into the real world to make useful uh, effects as well, which is what we're doing from the engineering point of view. Um, anything that has that ability to be represented in ways that can show variation uh, and then be subject to replication and natural selection can be used to adapt things. And this is done by a colleague of mine who used that process to evolve the shape of crush rail in a car. So those are the things that keep you safe if you have a head-on collision. You want it to absorb a lot of energy before that, that energy reaches you. Uh, you don't want it to be too stiff, or the whole car will just move quickly and you'll be uh, killed one way. If it's too soft, you'll be killed another way because you will be too quickly. So you want something that has the properties to absorb as much energy in the front part of the car before it reaches you. Uh, and that's essentially what evolution was able to do. It produced this very odd-looking crush rail that looked uh, sort of like a downspout, the odd, oddly shaped one. Uh, but it turned out to do really, really well. In fact, it did uh, so well that it uh, reduced the uh, peak force uh, by 30%. Energy absorption was increased by 100%. It was also lighter, of course, cars companies uh, like as well. And it had a five-star uh, crash rating. So this is the sort of thing where evolution produced something for a car right, that was as good in some cases better than what you need to do. Uh, and that's the stage where we're at now. Uh, this is part of a competition that occurs every year now at the professional meeting for evolutionary computation, where they take the submissions of people who have applied evolutionary com uh, computation in one way or another towards some practical problem. And the question is, can you show that it's done something as good as or better than what the humans have done. And each year, uh, the results are just amazing with the sorts of things that it's come up with. Uh, the winners are, are, are uh, crowned with a little statuette of a little uh, Darwin bobblehead guy. <laughs> uh, it's called the Humi, the Humi Awards. <laughs> uh, and that's the, the engineering aspect of this. Now, evolution through this type of process is able to produce on its own practically useful benefits in real world applications. Uh, and that's the thing that I think people haven't yet appreciated about the power of evolution being now uh, applied uh, in action uh, to useful cases. And this is just an example of some of the uh, areas in which uh, this is now being applied. Um, the little antenna on the right is pretty famous. Uh, it's, it's one that was evolved uh, it's now up in space in a satellite. It's uh, something where NASA had some specific specifications that they needed, and it turned out the evolutionary approach did far better and faster than the antenna engineers did. So that's the one that's up in space. So a lot of examples of this now. But I think people don't quite realize the degree to which uh, evolution can do in practical ways uh, the sorts of things that it's done, of course, for millions of years and five hundred years. All right. This is useful as well, right? This is useful uh, for your students possibly uh, in, uh, in the future. This is, this is uh, an ad from Google uh, looking for, uh, uh, for employees. And one of the things that they were interested in seeing is people know about genetic algorithms. Well, that's what this is. There are several names that are used. Genetic algorithms is one of them. Evolutionary computation is the general term. Uh, evolutionary algorithms and so on. Um, but, Google wants people who know some evolution. This can be something that they realize uh, is, is useful for them as well. So this sort of takes you from that initial biological world to the link to the virtual world and then back again to the real world. 
Uh, and that's the stage that we're in now. What I think uh, your students are going to be interested in is playing with some of this themselves. So I just want to give you a very quick um, uh, demo of what the Amita Ed program looks like. So as I say, it's a, it's a virtual uh, petri dish that we, we have here. Um, you can increase the size a little bit here. So what we have is a uh, what we call the freezer. This is done on analogy with response to biological experiments. It was E. coli, right? You have a little petri dish. Well, here you have your virtual petri dish, but you can store your guys in the freezer. Them out. So we start with our ancestor, and we're going to pull him into the, into the center. So there it is. Now, that dot represents the genome, the organism of what we've seen before. And when I run it here, what you're going to see is what happens as it starts to replicate. Um, The, the colors in this case are representing slight differences in fitness. It takes a while before it starts to evolve anything that is, that is usefully advantageous. Um, but over time, you'll see in the, in the graph on the right, the fitness will slowly start to, to go up. And in this case, there are a number of things in the virtual world that they're able to do to improve their ability uh, over others to replicate. And the key thing is that they have logic functions uh, that if they evolve the ability to form logic functions of various degrees of complexity, they get rewarded with extra energy, essentially extra computing time, which lets them execute their instructions faster, which then, if they're able to replicate, means that they replicate faster. That gives them the competitive advantage. So essentially, it's a kind of virtual catalyst that you see here. Uh, the energy that they get by having evolved the ability to use a resource in the environment lets them run faster, outcompete others, natural selection then happens, and they're the ones who will start to do uh, better in the population. I'll let this run just a little bit, perhaps by the end you'll see something. You can also then take any of them, and I'm going to look at it in the organism view, which is over here. This is what you've seen before. This is now, again, the genome of the organism. Uh, and I'm going to run it so you can see, uh, see what it looks like as it goes. Right, so here again, you're seeing uh, the execution um, of the instructions. And in this case, it's gotten to the point where it has successfully um, budded off the daughter cell and divided. Now, in this case, it's a clone. Right? There wasn't any mutation set in this case. But you can have um, changes in the mutation rate that you set for yourself. So and now when I run it again, this time, uh, during the replication process, there's going to be a chance at each instruction site for that instruction to randomly mutate to any other set. And what you're seeing now on the right, all again, the moving circles that surround some of them, those are instructions that have randomly shifted and been changed from those in the original one. So there you have variation arising. That's what was happening back in the population. If it turns out that some variation makes it a little bit better than its competitor, it will run a little bit faster, and that will give it a competitive advantage, right? That's natural selection happening. So let's just go back and see what anything's happening in the population. There you go. Something's already happened, right? Some subpopulation here has figured out uh, uh, through evolution something that gave it an advantage. And we can look in there and see, right? Uh, click on, on this guy here, for example. We're able to see up here what its properties were. And this one turns out to have evolved already three uh, functions. Right? Three functions gives it an energy boost that's considerable over others, and so that's why it's doing better. This one here is likely to have done even better in some respect. Um, this one, I think that turned out to be viable. That's an interesting but you can click around. This one here performs four functions. That's why it's doing better than those there. And uh, all of this is just happening through that process that I showed you, right? Um, random mutations that are happening in the code that might give it a selective advantage. If it does, it's getting a little extra energy boost. 
that's what's giving it the ability to reproduce faster, and that's why it's growing in the population. So really, you can then watch this happen. You can have your students do this. They can evolve their own organism, extract it from their dish, and input it into their uh, neighbor's dish, and they can have competition, little Darwin death matches uh, in each other's uh, petri dishes and so on. Uh, and we created a curriculum of model exercises that go along with this, so you can get, essentially, the basic evolutionary concepts that uh, are the ones that you wouldn't be trying to teach anyway, but instead of just telling them about it, right, now you can have it, them see it and do it for themselves. Um, you can run them through the entire process of generating their own hypothesis, coming up with a protocol, running it, doing the experiment, and, and all the way through uh, in a way that lets them really experience the kind of research that we do. And again, this is based upon the same research engine that we use generally for what we're doing. So it's not a toy, just an educational uh, program. It's the research program with an interface that allows them to do it in a, an intuitive way without having to know the, the computer code or anything like that sort. Of. So that's the thing that's very exciting. We've now done a national study of this, um, of, of effectiveness with pre post tests, and we see that, in fact, they do learn. Uh, and the, the kinds of concepts that uh, the standards now say you want to get across to your students, we're now able to see that students, in fact, do, do this hands-on way, get it in a way that's pretty compelling. Uh, and we also find that not only are they learning more about evolution, they're actually accepting it more too, which is which is a, a nice finding that isn't always the case. You can sometimes get them to pass tests, but they don't necessarily want to ever accept it. And here we're beginning to see that, that those things can be linked if they're able to do evolution in action for themselves and see it. Uh, and that's the thing I think is, is pretty compelling. We're very excited about this. So just to finish up, let me go, uh, go back and, and uh, uh, wind up with uh, what I hope will be useful for you. Uh, we now have, oops, I'm afraid there's an automatic Uh, a question. Is that for 
high school faculty as well as two and four year college faculty, did you say? There, we will have some spots for some high, high school faculty as well. For the first one, we're going to do primarily uh, undergraduate, um, but we have used this in um, even bio classes, and we know it works there too. Uh, and we'll expand more of that later. But the, the first one will be primarily undergraduate tutor, but we'll have room for some some high school maybe bio teachers as well, uh, and then we'll expand that as we go along. So we hope uh, we get people who are interested in this. Uh, it's it's quite exciting what we've seen so far, and we can't wait to have people uh, really use this uh, more extensively. Uh, and then, if you want to try it right now, let me just add the last URL. That's uh, our home page uh, where you can download the software, look at the model curricula that we have, uh, and background articles, uh, and really the information that you can use. At this point, the main uh, program, the most recent version of the program, is on the Mac. Um, the previous version of the program, there's a PC version of that, so we don't have a PC version of the latest one, um, but we're in the, in the process of, of updating the software again, so we will run, uh, once again, cross-platform. Um, the other thing about the grant that we have, so we'll be able to put in, finally, uh, new capabilities. People who've been using this always ask, hey, could we do this, could we do that? And, and so we have a whole list of things. At this point, they're asexual organisms, but we're going to put sex in there, and, uh, there are all sorts of things that people have been asking, uh, uh, ecology and, and uh, the ability to do uh, genetic engineering and you can engineer your guys and compete against the uh, uh, evolved ones, guessing the evolved ones will still win. <laughs> uh, so there are a lot of things that we'll have coming up uh, in the five-year process as well. So we hope that we can get people involved in, in helping us develop that as we go along. So I hope I've whetted your appetite a little bit. I'm happy to take a, a few questions here. I get a few more minutes. Yeah. So you had um, on your list something about using it in the development of medicines. Could you talk a little bit more about that? So this, so again, our program here is not aimed at doing that, but the general uh, process of using evolutionary design is what I was talking about there. So that's the idea of, of um, chemicals that would target particular things. I mean, drug companies are constantly trying to find, you know, Variations that will do slightly better uh, than some others. So the way it works here is that you essentially have uh, an experiment where you create biochemical differences and, and then do a selective experiment to generate kind of generate try to say here's something that will be slightly better at whatever we're talking about. Yes? There were times when I was getting confused about how much of this is modeling evolution versus how much is modeling learning or artificial intelligence. And some of the models or examples seem easier for me to kind of get my head around than others. But do you ever find yourself blurry about the boundaries between the two? Or um, so, I mean, or some of them don't like learn from mutations. They don't desire to evolve. But a lot of these models, it's my goal is to learn how to walk. Or, yeah. So of course, its goal never is to learn how to walk, right? It's just an environment that happens to reward that. So it's the evolutionary sense of this. It's not something where uh, it has any goals as such, right? If it's in an environment that re rewards something, and actually in the walking one, it, it wasn't uh, even said by the programmers to learn to walk. The only reward was, can you get farther than someone else without falling over? Right? That was the reward in that, in that kind of case. Um, but your point is actually really interesting. The relationship between evolution as a process and intelligence, okay, so actually some of the research that we do at Beacon is to use these models to investigate the evolution of intelligent behavior. Right? So some of the things that we were talking about here were actually research projects that were looking specifically at how you could get an evolutionary process, which we know is what produced intelligent creatures, right? eventually pretty smart ones. Uh, these are really still very stupid, but they're evolved stupid ones, right? <laughs> which, is, which is progress already, right? Um, we're now in a position that we weren't in before where you can do experimental evolution of intelligence, right? That's the thing that we're doing here, right? So from the point of view of um, the classes that we normally teach and so on, that's not the point. The point of the Vita Ed is to model evolutionary processes, right? 
and also to model the process of science, right? So the, the, the general project is how you learn better about evolution and the nature of science. And the point about this is that you can see how it is that science works, right? How do we test a hypothesis? How can you test a hypothesis? And it's essentially an evolutionary lab bench in that sense. So that's what we're trying to model in, in this case. Um, what I was showing you here are some of the cool things that you can do beyond that uh, in the research setting, which definitely goes into uh, how we get to intelligent creatures in the first place. So, like, is it totally random events that enable the one robot to get to the light? Uh, not totally, because the other thing, of course, is natural selection, which is not random. Okay? So, the process that's here is the evolutionary process, which has the random element. That's to say the variations that arise, arise at random. Right? In fact, the nice thing about this is that students can really see that happen. They might not believe it at first, but you start off in exactly the same, and they can look at their neighbor and say, boy, you know, we started the same, but they're different. Right? Everyone is going to be different. It does, it's, not, it's not designed in. Right? So the variation that arises, arises at random. But natural selection is a non-random process operating upon that. That's what then is going to produce it. So all of these cases are ones that combine both of those elements in the same way that happens in the natural world. Thank you. And that's what we want people to really get. Right? How is it that the evolutionary mechanism works to produce adaptations? Okay. Here was a question here. Uh, could you um, um, uh, expand a little bit on the, you had a slider there that gave you, uh, 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 you know, the rate of mutation, for instance. Do you have mechanisms, feedback mechanisms that alter the mutation rate? You know, so you know, basically there are rewards for a higher mutation rate or lower, you know, which does make you know biological systems to um, In the research version, we have done those experiments, but that's not built into the education version. Here, we set one mutation rate, and then it runs at that rate. So there's no feedback mechanism. That's just the environment saying this is the mutation rate in this environment. Um, part of the design principle behind the ed was to really make it so that it's perfectly clear at every step that evolution is doing, as opposed to you know, something being done by a new program or someone else. Right? So you don't want anything that they couldn't see how it happened in just the way that evolution says it happened. Right? So this is one of those cases. Now, you're right, in the real world, you might have that kind of feedback mechanism. Um, but here, we want to just make it very simple so that we can say, given this rate, given this set of parameters and so on, what does evolution do? And once you start a run, so you, you put in your ancestor or ancestors, you can have competition runs and so on. Uh, you set your environmental parameters, which, which I didn't show you, but you can set what the reward, possible rewards are or not in that population. Yeah. Uh, once you run it, then it just goes. Right? You don't intervene, it's hands off. It's just evolution doing it. And that makes it really clear to the student that it's the process of variation, characters, natural selection, which is getting function out at the other end that wasn't there at the beginning. I would appreciate it greatly. Yeah. Uh, just, you know, the situations that real organisms have evolved in, you know, that reward, you know, the environment has changed over time based on how chaotic or how stable the environment That's right. Actually, this is a project with one of my graduate students where we did something on the evolution of mutation rates. So you can use this for just those uh, sorts of experiments. Perfect. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you.